Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We honor your word. We receive your word this night. We thank you that it is being written in our heart and mind. We thank you that you're opening the eyes of our understanding, giving us revelation. We will act upon it, and we will see the fruit of it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. This morning we began sharing on the subject of what to do when it looks like things are not working in your life. And the first point that we brought up is that means you and I have to change because God never fails. He says, I'm the Lord and I change not. We saw the scripture in 1 Kings 8:56. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses' servant. God's word never fails. His word will absolutely come to pass in every person's life that will hear and do it. So, if you're not seeing something happen, then that means there's changes that we got to make because God's not the problem. He's never the problem. You and I have been given authority. You and I have been given the faith of Jesus. You and I can see victory. We talked about the fact that we have a covenant with God and God remembers his covenant and he's ever mindful of his covenant. And what's his covenant? It's the word of the covenant that he's given unto us. God's word is that which he performs. And we pointed out that he is a performer of the word and how he swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. Therefore, God's word is something that God will absolutely perform or he'd cause himself to be in trouble because he swore by himself if he doesn't perform it. He will perform his word in our life. We talked about the fact that we must get accurate, precise, correct knowledge of the word if we're going to see God accomplish things. One of the reasons why people don't see things working is because they're not in line with the word. If we're not doing the word, speaking the word, thinking in line with the word, acting upon the word exactly and precisely, we're not going to see any victory come forth in our life. We saw the one scripture over in 2 Peter in chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3 where it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge. And what knowledge is this? This is the precise and correct knowledge of God, exactly what it says. The word epigenosis means precise, correct, accurate knowledge. That means you and I have to be exact. You got to know what it says. You can't think what it says, or so-and-so said it what it says. You got to know what it says. Through this exact knowledge, God's grace and peace are going to be multiplied to us. And he says, according to his divine power, it's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything that you have need of is provided in the word through the knowledge. Again, this is the precise, correct knowledge of God. God wants us to know that his word is the truth. And so what do we need to do? We've got to follow the directions of it, and we've got to be a doer of the word. We don't want scripture we didn't look at this morning, but it shows you the importance of being a doer of the word. The Bible even says in Matthew chapter 7, Verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. That's quite a statement. Who's going to enter in? He that doeth the will of my Father, which is what? The word of God. And the word doeth happens to be in the present tense. Meaning, the present tense, for you who are here for the first time, we bring up the tense voice and mood, which is important to understand what's being said. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing action. Therefore, he that is doing continuously, as Young's brings out this by saying, is doing, the will of my Father, that's the one who is going to enter in. That shows us something. You and I need to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We did look at the scripture over in James chapter 1 and verse 22. If we're not a doer, things aren't going to work for us in our life. James 1.22, it says, but be doers of the word, and this word be ye actually means to become in the Greek. It is this Greek word ginomai, which means to become. And this is in a present tense, which means that you and I are commanded here, because it's an imperative mood verb, it's a command, to become ongoing doers of the word. Present tense, continuous, repeated action. And not hearers only. If you're a hearer only, what happens? You deceive yourself. That means the word that we hear, we need to put it in operation. Just because we heard it doesn't mean it's going to produce fruit or produce results in our life. 
God expects us to take hold of the word and be a doer of that word. If we don't, what happens? Any man's a hearer of the word, not a doer. He's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. In other words, if you don't do the word, you will forget the word. It will not become a part of your lifestyle, even though you know what it says, but it does not become a part of the way you walk. But if you look into the perfect law of liberty and you continue therein, that means you're doing this, you're applying this word. He being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, because you're doing the word, you're doing the work that God wants to accomplish in your life, working out your own salvation, you're going to be blessed in your deed. And you're going to see that God is going to perform his promises in our life. Now, another thing that we pointed out is that you must know that all of the promises of God are already given to you. And this is extremely important, as we pointed out. All the promises of God are yea and in him amen. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Ephesians 1.3 says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That means that all the blessings of God have already been given to us. All the promises of God are already ours. If you don't know that, then you won't be able to possess them. You'll be looking for God to maybe give something to you when he already gave it to you, which is a mistake. Now, we also pointed out when the word comes to you, it's written in your heart and in your mind. In your heart, it produces faith. In your mind, it produces hope. And it's very important that we operate in hope because God is a God of hope. And through the scriptures that produces hope in us, as we saw in Romans chapter 15, we looked in verse 4, how the scriptures, through the scriptures, we're going to have hope. And what does hope mean? Don't think of hope in the way you think of it in our own understanding today. Hope in the Bible means a confident expectancy, absolutely confident, sure that it's going to come to pass. It is not wishful thinking like, I hope that maybe something will work out for me. No. I have absolute confident expectancy. That's what Bible hope is. And he is a God of hope. We see this in verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. God wants you abounding in confident expectancy of what God will do for you. And this is because the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace as you believe God's word. And that's absolutely of a necessity. We must believe God's word. We cannot be moved away from the hope of the gospel. If you lose your absolute confidence in knowing what God will do, are you going to see things work for you in your life? No. That's why the Bible says, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. All the promises of God give you hope, a confident expectancy of what God will do for you. You and I are not to be moved away from it. And what are we going to do? We're going to bring our hopes into being by our faith. Your faith is going to bring your hopes into being. Because the word in your heart produces faith. The word in your mind produces hope you are going to put your faith in operation to bring that hope into manifestation. We saw a scripture over in Hebrews chapter 10. We were talking about how we got to learn to speak the word, confess it, in to release the, our faith to put the promises in operation, bring them in operation. It says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. We pointed out to you that the word faith is a mistake in the King James. It should be translated hope. Now, some people out there think that the King James is the perfect Bible and that it's got to be the right one and that's the one they believe in. It's got to be the true one. It's got a multitude of errors in it. This is just one example. We're not down on translations. We're wanting the truth. That's the key. So what's the word faith? Here translated faith. It's the word el peace. The word el peace means hope. Notice, it's been used 54 times in the King James. 53 times it's translated hope. One time it's translated faith, erroneously. The word for faith is a different Greek word. It should never have been translated that way. The point being is that we're going to hold fast the profession or confession of our hope your confession of the hope, which is the word in your mind that you have a confident expectancy, is the release of your faith. This brings an important point. If you're going to see things work in your life, you need hope and you also need 
faith. You need both. If you do not have hope, it's going to affect what's in your heart because what you're thinking upon, doubt will get a hold of you, or if you're wavering in your mind, it'll affect you in your heart because those are all gates that come into your heart. So the Word is to be in your heart, and the Word is to be in your mind, and that is important. If you're going to see things be produced, that means you really got to guard not only your heart, but you got to guard your mind. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for a helmet, a hope of, the hope of salvation. The word in your heart is the breastplate of faith. The word in your mind, the helmet covering the mind, produces the hope or the confident expectancy of salvation of what God will bring forth in your life. So as we get the word in our mind and we get the word in our heart, then we can bring forth what we hope for through our faith being acted upon. Now, also another thing that we pointed out, and these are such important principles, we need to go over a couple more of these. In Job, chapter 6 and verse 25, the way that you bring things into being is by speaking and or acting on God's Word. In Job 6.25, it says, how forcible are right words. That means we've got to be sure we speak right words. If you speak wrong words, they'll do nothing. But if you speak right words, they will bring forth what God purposes. And what are we to speak? We're to speak the things that God says that we are to speak and to bring things into being. And this is very important because most people are not seeing things happen in their life because they haven't learned how to speak. And that is very important. Instead, they just kind of speak whatever they want. They just speak the problem or whatever. No. They might, people many times say, well, let's say like in the area of healing, I believe that God is going to heal me. What is that statement? Is that a release of faith? No. That's a statement of hope. I believe that God is going to heal me. It means they have confidence in it. He's going to do it. That's great. But that's not bringing it into being. That's just a statement of hope. Or that God will heal me. Or I'm believing God to do something. I hear people say this all the time. Or I'm believing God for such and such. Well, it's great you're believing Him. That means you can have faith, but that doesn't mean that it's being, something's being released to bring it into manifestation. Because you've got to work your faith. Your faith, if you don't work it, will not produce anything. James chapter 2, verse 17. Faith, if it is not works... It's dead being alone. Otherwise, your faith, which comes from the Word in your heart, is not producing anything until you work your faith. How do I work my faith? By speaking, by acting on the Word to release it to come to pass. It goes on in verse 20. He says down here, Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? It's possible to have the Word in your heart and have faith, and the word in your mind having hope, and yet your faith is doing nothing for you. It's a major reason why many people do not see anything work. They haven't seen anything go into operation because they have to activate their faith. They have to put their faith in operation. And that's the, what's going to bring the promises of God into being. Let's just give some examples where we need to do this. God says, and we bring this over to here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you have a general spirit of faith the day you got born again. We having the same spirit of faith. You got the same spirit of faith that I got that everybody else has got. And your spirit of faith is to be put into operation. I believed, therefore I speak. Because you believe, that doesn't mean anything's working yet. You speak because your mouth is a releaser of your faith in order to bring things into being. We even see a scripture over in Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 1 and 2. It says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being less left us of entering into his rest, as you possess the promise as you enter into the spiritual rest of God, that any of you should seem to come short of it. God doesn't want you coming short of any promises. So he expects us to possess them all. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. That tells you something. The Word doesn't automatically profit you, even though it's sown in your heart, producing faith, and in your mind, producing hope. What has to happen? 
has to be mixed with your general spirit of faith by acting on it. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. How do I mix it? Because I'm going to speak forth to bring things into being and I'm going to act upon the word or do what it says to see something come to pass. This is very important. And we want to talk about this speaking and prayer for a little bit. We've got other things we're going to talk about, but just briefly, I know there's people here who were not here this morning, and this morning's message was a very important message that I encourage you to get if you weren't here, because it brought a lot of things out that are important. One thing we must understand, when you put your faith in operation to see something come into manifestation, you're going to put your mouth in operation and start speaking what God says you're to speak. In Mark 11:23, it tells us, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, which would be something trying to hinder you from seeing God accomplish something in your life, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea. That means you speak commanding statements to that mountain to be removed. <coughs> Notice, it says, You shall not doubt in your heart, but shall believe. Here's where you're believing, and that means you're operating in faith. You believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Well, if I believe, then how am I putting my faith in operation? I'm speaking. Remember, if we believe, then we speak. If you believe that those things which you say shall come to pass, and you need to believe it. You need to not, well, I hope something happens. No, you got to know it's going to happen. When you speak, you believe that those things which you say shall come to pass. It's going to happen. Otherwise, you're in doubt, wavering, unbelief, and you'll see, won't see things come to pass. By the way, when it says saith here, it is not talking about you saying something one time and that's it. It is a present tense verb. The present tense in the Greek means ongoing action. In other words, this is saying, you are to say to the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. You don't doubt in your heart, but believe that those things which you say and continue to say which is what? Continuing to tell this mountain to be removed, be removed, continually speaking to it. Shall come to pass, you'll have whatsoever you say it. So, you're going to continually speak to mountains to be removed. That means you're continually putting your faith in operation. How about in the area of casting out demons? When we cast out demons and we command the demons to come out, what do we do? Do we speak to them one time and command them to come out and that's it? No. We continually apply our faith, working our faith, until they're driven out. How do we know that? This is exactly what Jesus did. In Mark 1.25, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. Did the spirit come out of him right away? No. The unclean spirit tore him first, and then it cried with a loud voice and came out of him. What does that tell you? The demon was resisting. Well, did Jesus just say at one time and just stand there and watch him tear him before he came out? No. What did Jesus do? Well, how can, I, how can you know? It looks like he said it one time, doesn't it? No, you look at the word saying, it tells you. He was saying, and this is the key, how was he saying this? Well, we happen to look at this, and it happens to be the present tense, which means Jesus rebuked him, saying and continuing to say to him, hold thy peace and come out of him. Continual application of faith in order to see results. One of the biggest hindrances that I see for things not working is people don't continue to speak and put their faith in operation until they see the results. You continually command the Spirit to come out until He comes out. I see a case over in Mark 9, the very same thing in verse 25. He saw the people come running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, he said, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, enter no more. The key is, how was he saying it? Did he say it one time? If he did, it would be an aorist tense in the Greek, but it's not. It is a present tense, meaning ongoing action. Why did Jesus need to keep saying it? In this case, it was even worse than in Mark 1. It says, the Spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. That's in the face of Jesus. It shows you demons have power and can resist. And the demon was tearing at him and even rent him sore. And when he finally came out, they thought he was dead. I mean, he really put him through the mill. But he came out, and he was also set free, of course. He wasn't dead. Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he rose. This guy was set free. But it shows you that you continually command the spirits to come out until they come out. What's that mean? You're continually putting your faith in operation. 
it is very important that you continually work your faith to see results. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. The word hold fast, what does that mean? This is a word which is in the present tense again. Continuous, repeated, ongoing action. We keep confessing and speaking and speaking and speaking until we see the results. The way you bring things into being is through your mouth, and that is very important. Now, how about as far as in spiritual fight against the enemy? Do we just fight against the enemy, resist him, or speak to him one time? No. He talks about in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. When we're talking about fighting this fight, it is an imperative mood, which means a command. You and I have been commanded. Now, is this something where I just fight for one time and just fight a couple times and then I, I'll just take a rest? No. He says, present tense, ongoing action. You're going to continually fight this good fight of faith until you win, however long it takes. You don't have a limit. You keep on fighting the fight until the enemy is defeated and put underfoot, whether it's speaking to a mountain to be removed, resisting the temptation so he flees, casting out the demons until they all come out over time, whatever it might be, you're going to continue to use your faith, as well as casting down from the heavenlies, because you and I have dominion, and we can cast down, throw down, and root out the spirits from the heavenlies, because we have dominion. But we continually put our faith in operation, and that is important. Now, another thing that we talked about this morning, but we want to really drive this home to you, is how to pray accurately. John chapter 16. In John chapter 16, we see in verse 23 something that's very important that is said. In that day, Jesus is doing the speaking. You shall ask me nothing. That means we don't pray to Jesus in the New Testament. The word ask is a word aratayo, which refers to, as you'll see, a request as a favor. I'll show you in a moment. And then it says, Verily, verily, I say unto whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. He's showing you now who do we pray to in the, in the New Testament. To the Father. And who's going to give it to you? The Father is going to give it to you. How do we pray? In the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is in a high priestly ministry at the right hand of the Father and takes the things that you bring to the Father and going through the high priestly ministry, he confesses that you before the Father and he also confesses that before the angels that go into operation. Now, when we see these two words, ask, we think it must mean the same thing, but it doesn't. In Lightning's Bible program, this is Strong's Concordance reproduced in Lightning Bible program. This is a particular place in Strong's where it brings a comparison of similar words but shows the exact meanings of them. Notice there's a number 2065, G means Greek, 2065. Here's G154. This is corresponding, of course, to strong concordance. And here we see the first word ask is this number 2065. What is number 2065? It is erateo, which means a request as a favor. In other words, the first thing he's saying is, in that day, you're not going to request a favor of me of anything. Nothing. Then he comes down and says, whatsoever you ask the Father, what about this word? This is a different word. It is now number 154, which is Iteo, which means a demand of something due. That is important to understand. Because you and I are making a spiritual demand according to the covenant that we have with the Father through Jesus Christ of what is due us. What is due us? All the things that Jesus did. Remember the Bible says that when we're a son of God, we're an heir of God. In Romans 8 it says we're joint heirs with Jesus. Well, if we're a joint heir, that means everything that he had an inheritance of, you and I have an inheritance of. Well, what did Jesus have an inheritance of? Well, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 tells us hath in his last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. If Jesus is an heir of all things, what does that make you? 
because the scripture we're referring to is over in Romans chapter 8, here in verse 17, where it says, If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If he's an heir of all things, what's that make you? An heir of all things. Now, has everything been given unto you? You better believe it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, All things are yours, because all the promises have been given unto you. We also saw the scripture in Ephesians 1, 3. We quoted earlier, but worthwhile looking at it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings. Notice the blessings are spiritual before they get manifest in the natural. This is why everything you do, you're going to bring things in from the spirit into the natural. They're spiritual blessings, and where are they? In heavenly places in Christ. Why are they up there? Because you must have to understand that our inheritance that belongs to us is reserved for us in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that you and I have been begotten again or born again unto a lively hope, a living hope, confident expectancy. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we've been born again. We've got a brand new spirit, the spirit of Christ. And what have we come to? To an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that faith is not away. You now have an inheritance of all the promises of God, a joint heir with Jesus. And where is this? It's reserved in heaven for you. It's in heaven. Well, I'm on earth. How am I going to get my inheritance from heaven to affect me here on earth? Well, you are going to do that through your faith. Your faith is going to tap into the laws of the Spirit and speak things into being to bring all the promises of God into being as you put your faith in operation. Now, how are you going to do this? You're going to pray. And the key is you've got to learn how to pray accurately and effectively. Where he said, whatsoever you shall make a demand of what's due the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. How do I make a demand of what's due me? I bring the scripture promise, the promise of God, and I speak that scripture promise. The Bible talks about put me in remembrance. What are we putting God in remembrance of? Of his word. We're putting in remembrance of his word in order to see the promises come to pass. He says, hitherto up to this time, you've asked Iteo, made a demand of what's due you of nothing in my name. Make a demand of what's due you, this word ask in all the prayer scriptures throughout the New Testament, all of them. And you shall receive, which is the word lambano. And this is an important point. Many people may speak the scripture promise, making a demand of what's due them, and that's good. But you've got to take hold of that. How do I take hold of it? with your faith. Your faith is going to take hold of the promise to bring it into manifestation. It's important that you understand that there are two words for receive in the Greek. One of the words is dekamai, which means a passive reception. I wait for something to come. The other word is lambano, which is an active reception. I do something to take hold of something actively to see it come. That's the word used here. It's not a passive reception. You are going to take hold of things. And it's important that you understand you are to take hold of all, everything that, you, that belongs to you. Think about it. How did you get born again? John 1.12. As many as received him, and what's the word received? Lombano. Took him. Lay hold upon him. To them gave you the power, the right to become the sons of God, even those that believe on his name. You had to take Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. <clears throat> when you confess that Jesus is your Lord, <clears throat> believe in your heart that God's raised from the dead, and you received him as your personal Lord and Savior, then you took his spirit into you, and you got born again. So you did that when you got born again. Well, why don't we do that with everything else? People are good to take, take, receive Jesus. I, you know, I've received Jesus Christ, and I'm born again. Well, we're supposed to do that with everything. Every promise, we are to take hold of it. How about the area of the Holy Spirit? How's the Holy Spirit come to you? In Acts chapter 8 and verse 14, when the apostles had received the word of God, by the way, this is the word decabai, they had ready, they had they received passively the word that came to them, and they got born again under Peter, Philip's ministry. They said unto them, Peter and John, what they do? 
they came down to them and prayed for them that they might take hold of Lambano, the Holy Ghost. They had to take the Holy Spirit into them. Otherwise, you actively receive the Holy Spirit. He was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on him, and they, the people, remember, took, laid hold upon and took the Holy Ghost into them. That's why you've got to get someone to act on the Word and receive the Holy Spirit to come to dwell on them, dwell in them. Everything that we take, are, we were, uh, are, of all the promises, we are to lay hold and take it into us in order to see it come to pass. In other words, one of the reasons why things aren't working for people because they haven't taken hold of everything that belongs to them. They're waiting for something to happen. Well, I'm waiting for God to bring this promise. I'm waiting for God. I'm waiting on the Lord to do such and such. That's a mistake. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 4, verse 16? The Bible tells us what to do to see God's mercy, which includes healing, deliverance, the love of God in action in some way, Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What's the word obtain? Lombano, take hold of actively. You are to take hold of mercy, not wait for it to see if it's going to come to you. I'm waiting for God's mercy. You'll wait forever. God says come boldly and take hold of that. You do it with your faith. I believe that I take hold of it by speaking that of the mercy of God, and it will come into manifestation in your life. Also, all the promises of God that belong to us, <clears throat> we're to take hold of them. In Matthew 21, 22, where it says, all things, that's all the things that are ours, all the inherited things that belong to us, heir of all things, whatsoever you shall iteo, make a demand of what's due you, in prayer, by bringing the scripture promise, believing, I believe that word in my heart. What am I going to do? You shall receive. Most people think, well, it means I'm going to get it. It's going to come to me. No, that's not what it says. Because it says you shall lombano it. I mean, I'm going to take hold of it. You are told to take hold of it. If you don't take hold of it, it's not going to come into manifestation. This is a major problem. People don't take hold of the promises of God. Look at a scripture over in Hebrews chapter 11. Many people th think that it was just Abraham's faith that produced the child. No, Sarah had to come in line as well. Look what it says in Hebrews 11:11. 11, 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received lombano, took hold of strength, which is the word dunamis, which means power, to conceive seed. She was past the age of childbearing. She had to take hold of power to bring forth that promise. In other words, God spoke the promise, this is what's going to happen, but she had to get her faith in operation to see it manifest. God's given you all the promises of God, but you've got to use your faith and do what He says to see this come into manifestation. Sarah had to take hold of power to conceive seed, and she saw it come to pass. You are going to take hold of the promises of God to see them come into manifestation in your life, and that is so important. Now, when you begin to do this, you need, of course, and we talked about this morning how you put on the whole armor of God through the Word in your heart, in your mind, so that you have power resident within you, and then as you pray and put your faith in operation, pray in the Word, you're going to release the power of God out of you with mighty force. Now, when you do this, you've got to know and expect absolutely know that power is going to be released out of you when you are speaking forth God's Word or speaking things into being. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of glory and express image of His person, upholding all things by the Word of His power. Notice, it doesn't say by the power of His Word. It says by the Word of His power. Sounds like a funny way to say something, but it's telling you something. Because the word, Word, is spoken word, rhema. So Jesus was upholding all things, everything, by the spoken word, which did what? It was of his power. It was releasing the power of God. The power of God comes into you through the word that gets into your heart and is producing that power resident within you. 
then you put the power of God out and as far as releasing it out to work on your behalf by speaking forth the word in order to release the power of God. And that's exactly what happened in this case. You and I are to put the power of God in operation by praying and speaking forth things into being. James chapter 5 and verse 16, look what it says. Confess your faults one to another, pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The word availeth is a Greek word, esko, which means to be strong and mighty. It brings spiritual might and force into operation. It releases it because you're going to pray according to God's word. And remember, we talked about the fact that when you take hold of these things, you're always going to do it with thanksgiving. Example, Ephesians chapter 5. This is talking about prayer of what you do to see promises come to pass. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says this, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are we, who are we praying to? The Father, right? How are we doing it? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what all belongs to us? All things, all the promises of God. So when we come to the Father in the name of Jesus for all things that we're going to take hold of, what are we doing? We're giving thanks always for all these things as we're coming in prayer. This is talking about what you're doing in prayer. You are going to give thanks as you take hold of the promise of God. Why do I do that? Because the promises have already been given to you. This means you're not going to come to the Father and ask Him to do something of giving you the promise that's already been set in the Word. We don't ask Him to give us the promise because He already gave us the promise. Instead, we thank Him as we take hold of the promise because He already gave it to us. That is an important point. If you are asking God to do things that he already did for you and already gave for you, it's essentially a denial that he did it for you and gave it to you. If he already gave it to me, why would I ask him to give it to me again? If you gave something to me and I say, hey, well, would you please give it to me? Well, I already gave it to you. Why are you asking me to give you something when I already gave it to you? Instead, I'm going to say, thank you as I come to take hold of what you gave to me. And that's exactly what we got to understand. All the promises of God belong to us. And you are to have absolute confidence in prayer because you are going to pray to release the power of God to bring the promises of God into being. And you're going to lombano that. You're going to believe you take hold of that with your faith and it's going to come into manifestation. So that means asking God for a promise, wrong, wrong way to approach him. Instead, you're going to make a legal demand of what's due you by bringing the scripture promise that already belongs to you, that's part of your inheritance to him. And what are you doing? You're going to simply say something to this effect, this, this, this effect. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that your word, the scripture promise, says such and such. And I'm bringing that promise to you, and I believe that I take hold of that promise and I declare that that promise is coming to pass in my life. I am speaking it into being to release it to come into being. Now people say, well, I see that I can believe I receive, but how can I say that it, it's happening? Because that's what God wants you to do. That's how your faith is going to work. We've got to look at this again. Romans 4, verse 17. This is a very important scripture. Unfortunately, the King James made a mistake and it's deceived the entire body of Christ because they believe what they see instead of checking it out. Call those things which be not as though they were. This has given rise to the teaching that I call something that's not being as though it already was done. I declare I'm already healed. By his stripes I was already healed. I'm already healed. I'm already healed. Praise God. I'm just going to run around confessing I'm already healed. Is that what we do? No. Why? Because that's not taking hold of the healing to cause it to come into me. When I say, 
by, uh, by his stripes I was already healed. What am I declaring? I'm declaring the scripture promise of what Jesus did for me, right? Didn't Jesus go to the cross, bear away our sickness, disease, and by his stripes we were healed? That means that's a fact that he accomplished for us. By declaring the fact that he accomplished, is that releasing it to come into me? No. Because by his stripes I was healed, then now I can take hold of his healing to see it come into manifestation in my life. In the area of deliverance. Because he has delivered me out of the authority of darkness and translated me into the kingdom, now I'm not under Satan's authority, now I can use the authority and begin to cast out the demons or speak to the mountain or take dominion over any, the enemies in some way by speaking to them and commanding them to come out or commanding them to be removed. What am I doing? I'm speaking these things into being with my faith to cause these things to come to pass. Well, who's doing it? God's doing it. But how's he doing it? By you speaking to release his power and his authority to bring things into manifestation. And this is important. We should know that mighty force is going to be released, power is going to be released, and you're going to speak things into being. Now, what about this verse? Call it those things which be not as though they were. The word be is a present tense verb. Present participle meaning being. The word were should be a different word if it was translated correctly. It's got to be something past tense, right? But it's not. It is, again, a present tense participle, the word being. I didn't show you this this morning, but for you who are, were, he, were here, you'll see this, and if you weren't here, you'll see it tonight. These are the two words, this is one of them, that is translated be, and it happens to be a present tense participle, as we see. This is the second to be word that in the King James was translated were. But notice, it is a present tense participle. Notice even looking at it, you may not know Greek, but look at this. Here's the word here, and here's the word here. If you can see these, you may not know Greek, but that word O is an omicron. That thing that looks like a V is actually a nu, which is an N sound. That T is what they call, uh, you know, a, a ta, ta and, uh, and A is an alpha. So here we got all these, these four letters, and it's got a rough breathing, mar a breath uh, a breathing mark and an accent above it. Now look at this word over here. You can see it for yourself. It's the exact same thing. It's got the exact same letters, breathing mark, and everything. What does that tell you? It's the same word. So what does that mean? That means that they made a mistake. We're calling the things that are not being as being. Call the things not being as being. That makes all the difference in the world. That means you are going to call things that are not being or not happening as being or happening. In other words, you're going to speak them into being to release them to come into being. What are you doing? You are speaking in the spirit, present tense declaration of what God is doing, because you're his spokesman, of speaking this into being that releases this promise to come into manifestation. This is why you would believe I take hold of healing and I would declare that healing is flowing into my body now. What am I doing? I'm calling those things not being as being, speaking them into being, and what does that do? That releases them to come into being. And we pointed out that this is what Jesus did. Jesus said, be healed, be made whole, be open, be uh, loosed, all these things. He spoke things into being. This is the way you and I are going to do things. And how are we going to do this? Are we going to just pray one time? No. This is a major problem. People have been deceived by the teaching out there that says pray one time. If you pray more than one time, you're in doubt and unbelief, and you must not have believed what you meant, said the first time. Assuming that faith is a one-time release that this automatically then comes to pass. Error. Instead, we always 
pray because faith is continually released at a point in time and another point in time. Every time you speak, you're putting your faith into operation. And you have been involved in deliverance. You know how this works. You command the Spirit to come out one time. Did it come out? Well, it's got to come out because I spoke. Well, when you spoke, your faith was in operation, but did it leave right then? No. You keep speaking and keep speaking and keep speaking, and then it finally starts to come out of you. What are you doing as you keep speaking? You keep your faith being applied. Power and authority and power and authority and power and authority. Every time you speak is being released until it causes that spirit to come out. It's the same thing in the area of healing. You don't just say, I believe that I receive healing and healing power is flowing into my body one time and that's it. No. You continue to speak it. You continue, as you continue to speak it, and continue to speak it, and continue to speak it, and continue to speak it, then the power of God will continue to flow into you to produce that in your life. In other words, you're going to just continually speak things into being. Luke 18, 1, he spake a parable unto this end, that men ought or must, it's necessary, always to pray and not to faint. God wants us to pray continuously and not faint. 1 Thessalonians. 517 makes it pretty clear it's pretty easy to figure it out pray without ceasing that means we don't stop so how did someone come up with pray one time and then don't pray again they somehow ignored the scripture didn't they no we pray continuously until we see the desired results come to pass we see this in prayer scriptures all over the place one of the scriptures we haven't shown you about Iteo and Lombano and how you take hold of things in the present tense is over here in 1 John 3, 22. Whatsoever we ask, Iteo, make a demand of what's do us, we, Lombano, take hold of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing his sight. Now when it talks about this word, Iteo, does this mean we do it one time? No. Present tense. Continuous and repeated. When it says receive, well, I'm just going to speak that I take hold of it one time. Do I do that? No. I continually take hold of it and speak that into being till it comes to pass because it's present tense. In other words, you continually speak things into being until they come into manifestation. That is very important. If you learn to do this, you're going to see great changes come instead of just praying one time and waiting and standing and waiting for something to happen and wondering why it never happened because you keep speaking it. Don't speak to the mountain one time and say command it to be removed and then just oh I just believe it's going to be gone. Well if it's not gone it's not gone. You're not going to quote believe it's going to be gone. It's going to be gone because it got, you got rid of it. You're going to speak to it and speak to it and speak to it and speak to it. You see your faith will give you victory but you've got to work your faith continually. And the great error in the body of Christ is that faith is released at one point in time and then that's it. Error. It is released continually by the application of it and it's continually doing something every time you speak, you speak, you speak, you speak. It is you putting your faith in operation. Now, if we're going to see things come to pass, we need to put our faith in operation continually. At the same time, what are some of the other reasons of why the enemy would be able to stop us and things aren't working? Because remember, we said if things aren't working, we've got to change because it's not God. God always brings things to pass. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, Keep, which means to watch over your heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues or the outgoings of life. Remember, where's the power of God going to come out of? Out of your heart where the word is, where the power of God gets resident. And then you're going to release that out from your heart. So that means you've got to watch over your heart. If you let negative, evil things come into your heart, is your faith going to work? No. This is why it doesn't work for a lot of people. Let's go back to the one scripture we looked at. <coughs> Mark 11, 23. Look what it says. You're to say to the mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart. If you doubt in your heart, is, it gonna th is anything going to move? No. Is your faith going to do anything? No. Because you got doubt. It stopped it from working. 
How about another place? Over in Matthew, chapter 14. Here's where Peter's walking on the water, remember? And he's coming on the water, and all of a sudden he sees the wind boisterous or strong and mighty, this means. And he was afraid. He's walking on the water. That means he's operating in the spirit in faith, a supernatural act to act. What happens? Is he continuing faith when he gets fear? No, he got afraid. What was the result of that? Beginning to sink. That shows you it's a spiritual revelation, not just a physical thing. Because if the water didn't suddenly hold you up, you wouldn't begin to sink. You'd, you'd be underwater just like that and plop right down. You begin to sink when you get out of faith. Of course, he had the smarts to say, Lord, save me, and he did. Jesus makes the statement. He stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why would you doubt? Otherwise, Jesus expected him to just continue operating in faith, and he wasn't supposed to doubt and let this fear get a hold of him at all. The devil had stirred this up, the strong wind against him. Another scripture that shows how we got to guard ourselves in our mind and also in our heart. It's in James chapter 1, over here in verse 6. It says, when he's to ask in faith, what's this word again? I tell you, remember we said it was in all the major prayer scriptures. You make a demand of what's due you in faith. By the way, what are we talking about? We're talking about wisdom. Is wisdom one of the promises of God? Yes, it is. Jesus made unto us wisdom. So how am I going to get wisdom? Well, I'm going to ask God to give me wisdom. No, I'm not. I'm going to make a demand of what's due me of wisdom and believe I take hold of wisdom from him because wisdom's already mine. That's what I'm going to do. If you lack wisdom, let him, I tell you, make a demand of what's due him of God that gives to all men liberally and abradeth not. In other words, if you need wisdom, God's not holding it back. It's already yours. It's a promise of God. He just wants you to come make a legal demand for wisdom and then take hold of it. The reason why you know you're taking hold of it is you'll see. Let him make a demand of what's due him in faith, nothing wavering. If you don't make a demand for that wisdom, in, if you're wavering, are you going to get anything? No. He that wavers like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Notice what the next verse says. Let not that man think that he shall lombano, take hold of anything of the Lord. Because he's wavering. You can't take hold of wisdom. You won't be able to take hold of healing. You won't be able to take hold of prosperity, or you won't be able to take hold of peace. You won't be able to take hold of power. You won't be able to take hold of anything if you are wavering. Therefore, we've got to guard our heart, and we've got to guard our mind, and that is so important. Now, how about when the devil comes against you with his attacks? Let's go back here to verse 2. James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. By the word, wait, the word fall means to fall as to be encompassed about, where this thing has surrounded you, peripipto. It's not like I accidentally fell into it. This thing has surrounded me and encompassed me about. Otherwise, the devil's attacks are coming against me with all these diverse temptations. What am I going to do? He says, count it all joy. Get your joy in operation. Knowing this, you've got to know what's going on. The trying of my faith, the devil is testing your faith. What's he trying to do? Stop your faith from working. Because he knows if you know how to operate your faith and you keep speaking things into being and keep doing what the Word says, all, all these promises are going to come to pass. Or you keep casting out and casting out, the demons are going to come out. Or you keep speaking to the mountain, speaking to the mountain, all the mountains are going to be removed. Or you keep believing you take hold of the promise and speaking into being, it's, uh, you're going to see all the promises come to pass. So he's got to stop your faith somehow. So he's going to tempt you in all these ways to get you out of the spirit, out of faith. The trying of your faith, what's it supposed to do? It's going to work or bring into operation and accomplish patience. What does patience mean? Patience in the Greek is a Greek word, hupomone, which means steadfastness, and constancy. Now, where is this steadfastness and constancy supposed to be occurring? Where is the temptation affecting you? Where is the temptation? Where is the battleground? In the soul realm, right? 
coming against your mind, your will, your emotions, trying to get you to think wrong, choose wrong, react to your emotions. So where am I going to have to be steadfast on the Word? In the soulish realm. And this is what it says. It's going to bring into operation or work or accomplish steadfastness. And what is that? We know that it has to do with the soulish realm because it goes back here in Luke 21, 19, and it makes this statement. In your patience, what's the word? Steadfastness and constancy possess you your soul. So where is this talking about you being steadfast? In the area of your mind. Your mind must be steadfast to continually do the word. Remember, the word produces hope in the soulish realm. And this is why you've got to have the word anchored in your life. In fact, talking about hope for a moment. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 and 19 speaks of how we lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of what? The soul. Hope, which is, remember, the word in your mind, confident expectancy of what God will do, anchors your soul so I'm not moved by any attacks that come against me. If the devil can be successful by trying your faith to get you to waver in your soul, doubt in your soul, back off the word, faint, get moved by your emotions, get out of the spirit and start looking at things in the natural, anything but stay in the, on the word of God steadfast, then he's been successful. But if hope is anchored in you, the word is anchored in you, it's going to anchor your soul. So you're not going to be moved by anything that comes against you. We come back to James chapter 1 where we see in verse 3, the trying of your faith will work steadfastness, which is of the soulish realm. Meaning, if you don't have the word established in you, in your soul, you're going to end up being wavering, doubting, drawing back, being moved by whatever wind comes against you. You'll get right out of the spirit. You'll quit speaking the word of God. You'll start thinking these other things. And the devil's been successful. The trial of faith, just put your faith, sh shut your faith down, and your faith's not doing anything. This happens to so many people the devil's temptations come against them. I even had a woman even write me an email and how she all of a sudden some, she was getting victory in some areas and all of a sudden some things started showing up again and she said the reason was because she had all these attacks coming against her with people speaking slanderous evil things against her and it got her out of the spirit and she was all hurt and upset and disturbed by all this. I said, this was a trick of the devil to get you out of doing what God wants, and you started reacting in the natural to what was going on. It shut down your faith, and now you're allowing the demons to work against you and cause these problems. See, this is why you have to understand. The devil will do everything possible to get you off the Word and not doing the Word. He wants your focus on your feelings. He wants your focus on the circumstances. He wants your focus on, on some other negative thing. doesn't matter what it is. The devil will do anything to disrupt your faith from being in operation. To try to get you to quit speaking. Quit speaking things into being. Start wondering. Start wavering. Start looking at the circumstances. Hear some report from someone where it didn't work for them. Oh, I wonder if it'll work for me. I want to listen to that. Give them the truth and say, I work for everybody. God's word works for everybody. It doesn't. He's no respecter of persons. He will, his word will be performed for all of us. So it works patience. So what are you supposed to let patience do? Let steadfastness have its perfect work. I'm going to be steadfast in the soulish realm. I'm going to continue to speak. I'm going to continue to keep my faith applied. I'm going to continue to cast out. I'm going to continue to cast down from the heavenlies. I'm going to continue to speak to that mountain until it's removed. I'm going to continue to speak this promise into being and declare what God is doing for me now, and I'm not going to stop or deviate from it. I'm going to continue on praying without ceasing, calling things not being as being to bring them into manifestation. That's what we're going to do. That's what Romans 4 is, 17. We didn't finish that, but it says, you call those things that are not being as being to bring them into being. That's what you do. Many people, they think, how can I be one who calls things into being? Because God told you to do it. That's how you release him to bring it into manifestation. It says, let patience have a perfect work that you'll be perfect, entire, wanting or lacking nothing. And you're going to see the promise come to pass. 
But then he comes on the next verse and he says, well, if you lack wisdom because you don't realize what the devil's doing in this situation, this particular word, wisdom, is the word Sophia, which means seeing the broad picture of what's going on. I need wisdom in this situation. Let him make a demand of what's of God. He gives the men all liberally. A braid is not. It'll be given him as long as he doesn't waver. See, if he gets you wavering, he's been successful. Fear, doubt, wavering, wondering, drawing back, feigning, all those things. The devil's tricked you. He got to you. He got you off your faith. He got you to draw back. And you're in, because he, we were not steadfast on the word of God. And that is extremely important. Many people don't see things come to pass because they do not defeat the enemy's attacks that are coming against them. We've got to guard ourselves. Look at what it says over in Hebrews chapter 10. When you are putting your faith in operation to see promises come to pass, well, Hebrews 10 verse 38 says, the just shall live by faith. Everything we do is with our faith. We keep, you're going to speak things into being and act on the word continually. If you haven't learned to do that, then what are we walking by? By the natural, by human nature, by whatever I see, whatever I feel, whatever comes my way, whatever I think about it. They're never going to get anywhere that way. We can only operate in the spirit by speaking what God says. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God says, I don't have any pleasure in people that draw back. You say, well, I had this attack that come against me. I just kind of let it just get me. Sorry, God's not pleased because he doesn't want you ever to draw back because he's given you all the promises of God. He's given you the faith that will move every mountain. He's given you everything that you have need of, and he's shown you how to do things. All you've got to do is just speak these things into being and guard your heart, guard your mind, not let the devil get to you. Be steadfast when the attacks come and you're in the soulless realm and be, keep doing and constant and doing the word. You don't be moved by anything. My soul will have no pleasure in him. We're not of those that draw back into perdition, but those that believe in the saving of the soul. You see, over in Colossians, we looked at the one scripture, but look at the scripture in verse 23. What are we supposed to do? Continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Anything that tries to stop you from acting on the word and continually putting your faith in operation, or get you moved away from the confident expectancy of what God has done, that's the devil attacking your mind. Is the devil trying to stop your faith from working? He knows your faith will produce the victory. He knows that the word in you produces the power of God. That's why he's got to get the word out of you. That's why he comes for the word's sake, doesn't he? He comes to tempt you to try to take the word out of your heart. If you can't do it, get it out right away, he'll try to bring affliction, pressure against you, or persecution, so you'll draw back and stand away. If that doesn't work, well, we'll try the, lust, the, the cares of this world. Get your mind on the cares of this world. Or the deceitfulness of riches. Go after all these things. Or lusts of other things entering in. Anything that just gets you off doing the word. If the devil can do that, he's been successful. He stopped you from operating the spirit. He stopped you from operating in faith. And no wonder we're not seeing things come to pass in our life. God does not want us to get placed from we're not going to faint whatsoever in the area of understanding. Well, I've been speaking and I've been doing things, but I haven't seen anything come to pass yet. Well, we've got to find out, are we speaking the right thing? Are we also maintaining faith? Are we guarding our heart? Are we guarding our soul? Are we being steadfast? Are we not giving place to anything to draw back? Are we not being moved by any of the attacks of the devil working to try to get us out of the spirit? Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. That's great news for the guy who's sowing the right thing. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. It's going to happen in my life. Hallelujah. He that sows to his flesh, that's the wrong thing to sow to. That means you're doing things according to my human nature, what I feel, the ways of the flesh. Well, the flesh is going to reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Everything that you sow in the Spirit, you're going to start reaping the good things of God, life everlasting. Don't be weary in well-doing, 
That's another thing. The devil will try to get you weary, get you tired, get you faint. I'm tired of that casting out, or I'm tired of speaking. You know, we'll try another way. Ah, the devil likes that one. I'll try another way. I'll try, oh, there's a natural way that'll solve my problem. No, it won't. It might put a Band-Aid on it. It might deal with some symptoms for a while, but it will not get the spirits out, nor will it bring the power of God in to bring forth the promise. You're just trying to deal with it in the natural. Just gonna, it's like a cover-over to deal with things so you feel better, but it's not going to get rid of your problem. He says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That means you're going to do a lot of sowing, and you're going to sow and sow and sow and sow and sow and sow and sow as long as it takes, and you are going to reap if you faint not. Well, we're not going to faint. Now, what about when the pressure comes against you, when the devil starts attacking you? What are we going to do? <clears throat> verse Peter 1, verse 6. Look what he says. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. All these temptations are coming against me. All these attacks are coming against me. And I get heaviness. That's the devil's attacks, right? What are you to do? I'm all sad, sorrow, depressed, down, discouraged, and all this. No. I greatly rejoice. Why am I greatly rejoicing in the midst of heaviness and temptations? Because I know that the devil's trying to get me out of the spirit. He's trying to, joy protects your faith and helps to keep you in the spirit as you keep functioning, putting your faith in operation. Therefore, I need to greatly rejoice in what God is doing and not let my soul get overtaken by the heaviness. I'm not going to let the devil get to my soul. I'm going to greatly rejoice. Why? 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 You've got to know what's happening. That the trial of your faith, the devil's attacking my faith. Being much more precious than of gold that perishes. What's, what's precious? Not the trial. I've had some people say, is the trial precious? No, it's not. It's talking about your faith. Your faith is what's more precious than of gold that perishes. Why? Because your faith will bring everything that you have need of into manifestation in your life. Everything. Though it, your faith, be tried with fire. Yeah, the devil's coming. He's just testing your faith every which way. He's trying to stop you from speaking, stop you from taking hold of things, stop you from casting out, stop you from staying in the spirit and bringing things into, the man, into manifestation. He wants you to get in the natural. He wants you to look at their circumstances. He wants you to move by feeling. Well, check out your feelings. That's not going to help you. I'm going to speak things into being, and it's going to bring the change in the natural. Well, though it be tried with fire, it's to be found in praise and honor and glory. And at the appearing of Jesus Christ, that's when he shows up, the revelation of Jesus Christ, when he manifests himself as you continually put your faith in operation. Whom having not seen, well, I don't see him. Well, everything we do is faith in the Spirit. You love in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, I'm believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I continually rejoice that I'm speaking these into being. The power of God's working. The devils are attacking me, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to speak this into being, and it's going to come to pass. With joy unspeakable, full of glory. Receiving what? The word receiving here is the word commitzo. It's not lombano. Receiving, which means to carry off. For yourself, essentially. Carry off the promise. Carry off the end of your faith. And what's the end of your faith? The result of your faith. Victory over the temptation, the attack that's coming against you, which is what? The salvation or the deliverance of your souls. Where's the attack? In the soulish realm, isn't it? So what's God going to do? What do you do when the attack comes against you? You, can't, you don't get under it and let it beat you down with heaviness, sorrow, sadness, poor old me. What am I going to do? You know, all this kind of stuff. No. You greatly rejoice knowing what's going on, and you continue to keep your faith in operation. You rejoice with joy, speakable and full of glory, because, <coughs> because you're carrying off the end of your faith. Your faith is continually operating, that means. Your faith is continually speaking things into being. Even the salvation, you're going to be delivered of all the attacks that come against you in the soulish realm. Look at a scripture over here, and even and another one he brings up in Peter. 
1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. We had days when it seemed, seemed like all hell broke loose. This thing happened, that happened, that happened. All these diversions to try to get you off track. That's the devil showing up. Don't think, I'm sure it's strange that I've had these attacks. That's just the enemy coming against you. You've got to discern things in the spirit. Rejoice in so much you're partakers of Christ's sufferings. Part of the suffering is the attacks of the enemy. Not that we succumb to them or receive them or let them overwhelm us. They are going to come because you are going to have attacks. <clears throat> Persecution comes against you from the enemies. Partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, and when's his glory revealed? When the manifestation of the power of God comes forth. That's the presence of God because you keep operating your faith, you keep speaking things in the being, the glory of God, the manifest presence of God shows up and the enemies are destroyed in your life. You're going to be glad with exceeding joy. Otherwise, you're not going to cave in under the attack of the temptations. This is another major thing. Many people are not steadfast in their soul. They end up drawing back. They end up fainting. Or maybe they get in fear, or they doubt, or get wavering, or whatever all. They don't continue on. They don't continue sowing. They get out in the flesh. They get in. Their soul is not being guarded. Their heart's not being guarded. And what happens? The enemy comes in, and you have a fall. You have a faith fall. And so your faith's not operating anything, and then you get all down, depressed. Poor old me. And then you, if you don't deal with that, the devil will just keep on pouring it on, and he'll just try to sink you. And he'll try to tell you, your faith will never do anything. You can't do anything. These promises aren't for you. You can't get delivered, blah, blah, blah. And if you believe those things, then he'll really sink you. Do not ever believe anything contrary to the Word. The Word is the truth. Your faith will give you the victory. Your faith gives you the victory over the world. Your faith will cause you to possess every promise of God in your life. But you've got to overcome all these attacks. You do have to watch your words. You can't be speaking what God's doing for you now and then speaking what the devil's doing the next minute. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I take hold of your healing power. I thank you. Your healing power is flowing in my body in the name of Jesus. And then an hour later, I don't really see anything happening. You just shut it all down. What are we talking about? We're seeing, are we doing things in the natural? No. What are we doing when we're putting our faith? We're bringing things from the Spirit into the natural, so everything you're doing is speaking in the Spirit. You're going to speak in the Spirit, speak in the Spirit, speak in the Spirit, speak in the Spirit, and it will show up in the natural. It's the same thing in casting out. It's such an easy thing in casting out. Because, well, I command this demon to come out, and it didn't come out. Well, what do I do? Continue to command, 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 until it starts coming out, coming out, coming out, and it starts breaking the bondage in your life. Well, I see a little bit, but I haven't seen all this change. What's that tell you? We've well, got more to drive out. So what do you do? Continue on. You continue in faith. What do we do? We continue in faith, grounded and settled. We're not going to be moved away from the hope of the gospel. We continually work our faith with power to see it come to pass. Look at this scripture in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.11. We've got to eliminate all these enemies. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling, fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. God will do this, but you know, you and I have a part to play. Who works your faith? You do. By speaking and doing what he says. How do I work my faith? By speaking things into being, by taking hold of the promise and speaking, declaring what God's doing for me now, by releasing his power and authority by speaking and commanding the demons to be coming out or removed or resisting the devil's temptations, you have, a fa have faith that will move every mountain, that will bring every promise, that will bring everything into manifestation. The battle is the devil will do everything possible to get you out of the spirit, out of faith. Because faith is that which is of the spirit. You say, well, I don't feel like I have faith. Guess what? You're in the natural. Faith has nothing to do with feelings. Well, I don't feel anything. Who cares what you feel like? We're not functioning in the realm of the feelings. We're functioning in the realm of the spirit. You keep speaking it in the spirit because everything you do with your faith is bringing things from the spirit into manifestation in the natural. Until it's manifested, you've got to keep speaking it in the spirit until it comes into manifestation.
What's our feelings got to do with it? None. What does the thoughts have to do with it? If they're not in the Word and have confident expectancy of what God will do, if it comes in and says, well, how do you know God's going to do this for you? What are you going to do with that thought? You better take that thought captive and jump and put that down immediately because remember what 1 John chapter 5 says about how when we have prayed something that's according to His will, He hears us. And if we know He hears us, we know we have the demands that we're, we made a demand of Him. We know we have them. We know we got them. The word petition, ask, and desire is all iteo. We know we have it. Do you know you have the things you prayed? How can I know I have the things I prayed? I know I have it when it comes into manifestation. You're not, we're not, we're missing the boat. You don't know you have it when it comes into manifestation. You know you have it in the spirit because you're speaking and putting it in operate, your faith in operation. And you know that God has heard you in the realm of the spirit and you know you have it and you keep speaking into being and then it will come into manifestation. In other words, the natural is never to be the barometer of whether God's doing something or not. Or what you have. I don't feel it. I don't see it. I don't think I got it. I don't know if it's working. The devil's been successful. He got you into the soulless realm. He got you into the natural. He got you into looking at the circumstances. Your faith to shut down and it's not doing anything. You must understand everything is going to be brought into manifestation through your faith. You need a victory conscious. You need a conscious knowing what God will do. Well, how can I know what God will do? Well, here's a good scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. Look what he says. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word giveth happens to be in the present tense, which means is giving unto us continuously. That's the way it's translated. That's why he says, thanks to him who is giving us the victory. How can I say God is giving me the victory? Because the word says he is giving you the victory. If you speak it into being, you release him to give you the victory. Thanks be unto God. They were speaking into being. Thanks be to God who is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just once in a while. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. It means God's not God. He's not no failures. Always. And when it talks about causing us to triumph, this again is, wherever the verb is, somewhere here, present tense, continuous. God always continually causes a triumph in Christ. What were these guys doing? They were speaking what God is doing for them. They're speaking into being, declaring it. What should you be doing? Doing the very same thing. What are you saying God is doing for you? Are you guarding your heart? Are you guarding your mind? Are you dealing with all the attacks that come against you that try to get you in the natural? What are you doing with the temptations or the things that come against you? Are you rejoicing in the Lord? Or are you getting down, poor old me, sad, sorrow? Is that faith operating? No. You let the circumstances pull you down. You drew back. God's not no pleasure in us drawing back. Everything will be in the spirit. That's why you continually rejoice. What do you think they did in Philippians? These guys were thrown in jail. Oh, what are we going to do? It's all over. No. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. They kept rejoicing and rejoicing. That's why the Philippian letter is called the joyful letter. That's all talking about when they're in the Philippian jail. Because they kept a rejoicing spirit. And then what they do? In the movement, they kept praying. They preached the gospel. They didn't hide in the corner. The jailer heard it. The power of God hit. Open up the place. That guy gets saved. That's not someone giving up and throwing in the towel. That's someone doing something about things in the realm of the Spirit, putting his faith in operation. God delivered him. God's my deliverer. He'll deliver me out of anything the devil brings. Faith will bring the promises. He always causes us to triumph in Christ. There's no defeat in God. There's only victory. And it's in our hands 
to bring it into being because he's already given us all the promises. He's already given us his faith. You've got the same spirit of faith as he's got. Your faith will do everything that Jesus' faith did. You're an heir of all things, and you can speak everything into being, and you can bring every promise into being. But we've got to eliminate all these things that are hindering us. If we don't know how to pray accurately, and we're still asking, requesting, waiting, wondering, we're going nowhere. If we haven't learned to speak for things and bring them into being, and we're speaking our circumstances, our faith's doing nothing. If we don't conquer the trials that come against us and, and deal with them successfully and rejoice and, and understand what's going on and keep our, be steadfast in the soulless realm so he doesn't get us off, we're not going to see results. But if you will come in line in faith, you're always going to operate in the Spirit. You're going to speak in the Spirit. You're going to think in line with the Spirit according to the Word of God. You're going to maintain hope. You're going to maintain faith. And as you speak forth, you're going to see everything come into manifestation. Remember, we'll close with this last scripture. We already saw this before. But you've got to remember how did Jesus do everything. And you have to believe that every attack, he was tempted in all points, yet like we are. We t he was tempted in everything that you and I have never even been close to being tempted in. Everything came at him. He was upholding all things by the spoken word of his power. Jesus operated in faith, and he saw everything come to pass. Everything was upheld by the spoken word of the power of God, because you're going to live by the power of God. That's the way we're going to live. This is why you've got to get the word in you. That's why you've got to put on the whole armor of God, so you've got the power resident in you. Don't let the devil take the word out of your heart. Get the word in your heart. Guard it. Keep it in your mind. Keep thinking on it. Start speaking it, speaking things into being. Now, if I ask you, what all have you been speaking into being? Speaking into being? What do you mean? 99.9% .9 of all the Christians don't even know what you're talking about because they, they haven't studied the scriptures and seen what we're supposed to do. God wants you to start speaking every promise into being that belongs to you, everything that you have need of, and keep speaking it into being until it comes into manifestation. And be ready for the attacks because the devil's not going to stand by He's going to try to get you out of faith. The temptations will come. But you're going to rejoice, and you're going to conquer them all, and you're going to see God bring forth the promises in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus I, thank you you I thank you and praise you that I am not going to let going to the devil stop, stop my faith from working. Faith from working. I am going to make the changes the coming in line with the Word of God. I have a covenant. God will perform his word. I'm going to get the word in me so I have accurate, precise, correct knowledge of the word of God. I'm going to put on the whole armor of God through the word in my heart, the word in my mouth, the word in my mind, the word directing my steps, the word doing everything in my life so the power is resident in me and I'm going to speak the word, pray the word, to release the power of God with mighty force. I'm going to follow the exact directions of the word of God, being a hear and doer of it. I will maintain hope, confident expectancy from the word in my mind. I will maintain faith, the word in my heart. I will make my mouth work for me by speaking right words. I will speak into being all the promises of God continually until they come into manifestation. I will pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. I will, with thanksgiving, make my demand of what's due me by speaking the scripture promise and I believe I take hold of it continuously declaring that speaking into being what God is doing for me now and as I pray continuously my faith is continuously being put into operation releasing the power of God 
And I know he's heard me, and I know I have what I have prayed. I will guard my heart. I will guard my mind. I will not allow temptations to get into me. I will rejoice. I will be steadfast. I will not give place to any doubt, fear, feigning, drawing back, unbelief, any attack to get me out of the spirit. I will continue to put my faith in operation. And as I continue to put my faith in operation, I will see every promise come to pass in my life. God is giving me the victory, always causing me to triumph as I'm speaking forth His Word, speaking into being what He is doing for me now. Just as Jesus upheld all things by the spoken word of His power, I'm going to uphold all things by the spoken word of the power of God. I'm not going to let the devil get me into the natural any longer or try some other way. I'm going to stay in the spirit. I'm going to keep speaking things into being. And I'm going to conquer the enemy and possess my promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You do these things, it will revolutionize your life. Will it be warfare against you? You better believe it. Are you going to conquer it all? Yes, you are, because you understand what's going on. Are you ever going to let yourself get into being down, sorrow, poor old me? No, I'm going to keep rejoicing, and I'm going to be steadfast, and I'm going to keep fighting that good fight of faith. I'm going to do whatever's necessary. It's a good fight because I'm going to win. God's always given me the victory. God's always caused me to triumph. We got it made. We just have to do what he says. And we got to get our mouth working for us. Don't speak negatives. You'll be taken captive by your words. Death and life are the power of the tongue. Take your thoughts captive. Don't let any negative thoughts come in there that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. You cast down every imagination. You bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You guard yourself so the enemy cannot get to you. You maintain faith and you maintain hope and you maintain your mouth speaking things into being and you keep your heart right, guarded, so the enemy can't get to you and you stay in the spirit, everything's going to come to pass. You're an heir of all things. We just need to go possess it. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that's been brought forth. Thank you for your word, which is the truth. We're going to be hearers and doers of this word. And thank you for much fruit and victory coming forth in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.